Taking the light to the gathering darkness, this is Wings of the Eagle Radio. Welcome to the End Time Revolution. Broadcasting worldwide on a mission to unite born-again servants to find the army of Elijah's preparing to face Antichrist to witness before all, come what may. This is Wings of the Eagle Radio. Yes, Wings of the Eagle Radio is back on the air with you. Good morning, if you're live. Hello there, uh, in Spreakerville, in podcast land, as well as the world of Facebook, which uh, you never know how that's going to quite work out. Um, But welcome, whether you're on the Wings of the Eagle Facebook page um, or on my personal feed, I am blessed to uh, be here today. I'm blessed that you would be here with me. And I'm um, just uh, in love with the Lord and um, thankful that he would overlook our sin and um, upon repentance wipe it all away. It's a great, great thing to serve him. So um, let's continue to do that today. And I hope this is interesting to you. Uh, Father, use this time for your glory and your word and your name and that we would hear your spirit and obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Good day. Good day. All right, we got uh, Elizabeth from uh, Australia. That's awesome. And fo- hey, Ryan, what's up, brother? Uh, Alex, hey, folks from all over, very good. Um, I do love the uh, wide appeal of our audience, the uh, geographic wideness of you. And uh, anyway, it's awesome. It's awesome. God is good. So today I wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, so there was a study that just got published from Barna, Christian um, survey outfit. And um, it was pretty stunning, the headline on it. And so I want to talk about that and then actually just read a little bit from a uh a book called Following Jesus, booklet, really, um, by a pastor who just kind of said, you know what, we got to break this down to basics. What does it mean to be a Christian, <laughs> to follow Jesus Christ? What does that mean exactly? Let's get basic. Don't get complicated. We don't need programs. We just need, we, we, we need to, what do we do? Here's what it means. All right, so anyway, I'll read from that in a second. But here's the study. Um, It's about evangelism. And the headline on it is, Half of Christian Millennials Say Evangelism is Wrong. Wrong. What? Um, So you dig into it a little bit. And first of all, let's define the term. Uh, Millennial... Uh, oh, hey, Alex, uh, I'll get to your question later, okay? Thank you. Um, millennials, they are defined as 20 years to 34 years old. So nobody under 20 is, was in this um, survey, and I, I guess when I think of millennials, I think of young kids, but that's from my past they were, but now they're, now they're 20s and early 30s. Um, so that's the millennials, 20 to 34 um, they describe Generation X as, that's my generation from 1965 to 83, in other words, age 50, 35 to 53, and then baby boomers being ages 54 to 72, and anyone older than that they call an elder. All right? So <clears throat> out of those categories in the church, professing Christians, okay, these are not um, you know, wishy-washy people. These, I, I don't know if they're all um, evangelical Protestants. Um, 
It says all Christians, so there must be some spread out in here. And frankly, the older, crustier churches, like the Catholic and Orthodox, etc., they place almost no emphasis on evangelism. None. Because I was in it, I know. Um, it's just not part of their thing. Yeah, this is this is... Anyway, point is, so that's when they say millennials, they mean 20 to 34 years old. And the question was this. Where do we get this 40% or 50% say it's wrong? Here's the statement. They are asked to say, I agree with this or disagree. The statement is, is it wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day share the same faith? That sounds like the goal of evangelism. 47% only agreed with that. Not only, excuse me, that's a lot. 47, it's almost half of people 20 to 34, professing Christians, say it is wrong to share your personal belief with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day share your faith. What the heck are we doing here? If that's not the, if that's not why you're doing it. Okay. Um, However, they will say that they know what they believe and they are confident in that biblically. They, 73% of millennials, 73%, so a lot, they feel equipped to share their faith. And they say they know how to respond when someone asks them about what they believe. Uh, which is a much higher rate than older generations, the older guys, the other categories, which is cool, but yet there's a big disconnect when they don't think they should actually do it. (laughs) Um, And here, like, this blows your mind. 95% of all Christians, no matter what your age, 95% believe evangelism is part of their faith. And the best thing that could ever happen to someone is for them to know Jesus. Okay, great. So it seems like 95% were on the right track. No, no real problem here. Um, but then when it actually comes down to doing it, half of these same millennials say, no, it's wrong. I'm not afraid or nervous or it's, it's uh, awkward or all that. I get all, believe me, I get all that. Um, but it's wrong. It's beyond that. It's beyond awkward or, or, you know, uncomfortable. It's wrong, 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 huh? So, so here's the state of the president of Barna, the guys who who did this study. He says we must persuade younger Christians that evangelism is an essential practice of following Jesus. The data shows enormous ambivalence among millennials, in particular, about the calling to share their faith with others. Yeah. So that's, that's what this, so, and you can check it out. You can go to Barna.com, and the latest uh, link on there is right there on the front of the page, okay? So you can go check it out yourself and read it. <clears throat> um, so that's the, that's the issue. Um, hey, friends. Elizabeth says, uh, we have two millennial children, girl 20, boy 24. They aren't Christians, right? They aren't even believers, so... Obviously, continue to uh, pray for them, lift them up, that they would come home to the Father. But, um, yeah, it's not a great track record, even if you are a believer. That's the, p- <laughs> that's the point. Um, so, how do, we, how do we change this? Look, I'm like, this is not some kind of theoretical thing either. Um, I have begun recently, a couple months ago, to um, teach our teenagers in our local church each Sunday. You know, call it Sunday school or or what have you. Um, So, I know, you know, I can relate. Uh, Technically, I guess they're not millennials even. I don't know what you call the, even the youngers, the Generation Z or something, who knows. Um, But I'm trying to instill intentionally and trying to instill in them, even right off the bat, just in the past month or so, 
um, to get right to the hard stuff. To, you know, don't be, we're not going to um, tiptoe around the, the controversial stuff. I asked them about what they're learning in school, about the social issues, about the abortion stuff, about the book of Revelation. That's what, I'm having them read it. Why not? Most of them have never even opened a thing before. Well, then thank God, right? So, um, point is, I you know, it's not just a theory. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm concerned uh, if this is an issue at large. So, um, uh, Alex says, uh, Jesus says, if you deny me in front of others, I will deny you. That is what he says, although the millennials here would say, I'm not denying him, I'm just not bring him up you know i'm not d with the intention of converting someone that's like a bad word i guess to them converting it's a bad word to a lot of folks because the church is weak um with that that language is kind of left it's like oh, i want to share jesus with you you know what i mean like the whole vocabulary has changed and that to me that doesn't produce disciples you know that produces somebody who likes um, you know, a vending machine. Yes, God loves us unconditionally. But this is how all the, I think this is probably where all this springs from. Like, you can keep in your old ways, in your, your sinful thing. You never actually repent or stop or change or have a change of heart or have a, you know, renewed spirit or mo renewing your mind. All that stuff that we have to do is just never done because it was too easy. Um, you know, and this is part of it. Well, I never have to convince anyone else. So. Anyway. Um, so this is an issue, okay? Real issue. So this is Wings of the Eagle Radio, by the way, Christopher Manti. I am, for no other reason other than what God, how gracious he is, and how um, how amazing he will use someone who's unqualified, under-educated, uh, um a failure uh, at business, um, you name it. And yet, uh, he's called me into pastoring an online church, co-pastoring in a, or under, uh, head pastor of a local church, running a international ministry, such that it is. Um, and I've authored now two courses online that you can sign up for, End Times for Beginners, highly recommended. Please go do that and support us in that way and learn a lot, most likely. Um, also, the Ten Signs, Return of Jesus is Near. So, these are accomplishments only God can get credit for. Not, certainly nothing I did. Um, and it's just a testament to His grace and uh, love, indeed, and mercy. Um... So anyway, this is one of the things we do as a, this is one of the ministries we have is to get out in this way. Okay. Um, so now that we define the terms, we find out half the millennials don't feel comfortable in, in actually wanting to convince another person to come to Jesus. That means you have to drop your old belief. <laughs> it just does. You know, I don't know if it's just, you know, individuals, some individuals have easier time accepting that than others, or I don't know. Um, but if you, you know, there are other religions in the world, and they're not compatible with Christ. Th that's the point. N nothing is compatible with him. He's alone. He says, I am God, and there is none with me. You can't get there another way. That whoever enters another way is a thief and a liar, or tries to enter. Can't do it. John 14, 6. John 14, 6. And we even... I almost went up, uh, did the show today about the Pope and the UAE, or yeah, um, this this whatever memorandum they agreed to with between uh, Islamic teachings and and the Catholic Church, and like anyway, there's a whole, that's a whole can of worms. But um, just that that whole thing. Um, Uh, Elizabeth says, some people in the 70s and 80s were quite openly sharing their faith. Jesus Movement, Larry Norman, Keith Green. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. It was different then. <laughs> but now, oh, the point is, you know, other religions, they're incompatible, right? John 14, 6. Uh, Pope Francis needs to learn John 14, 6. Apparently. 
Um, and so this is like, I always tell folks, if I ever get on, you know, somebody, CNN or somebody sticks a camera on my face one day, for whatever reason, hopefully it's for Wings of the Eagle stuff or End Time Church, um, that uh, the first thing out of my mouth is, yes, how, how are you, everyone? John fourteen six. <laughs> Jesus, right, I'm the way, the truth, I'm the only way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. That's the point. All right? And that's, that's why we evangelize, because you don't wake up knowing that. How will they know? Someone's got to tell them. That's God's design. Okay, so what I'm going to do, and maybe folks are still um, confused. This is the book I'm talking about, Following Jesus. As you see, it's very thin. It's not even a, a book. It's just a booklet, basically, for the basics. The basics. And this it has a short uh, bit here on sharing your faith. Uh, so I'm just going to cite this for a minute or two because it's pretty good. After Jesus was crucified and resurrected, three days later, he spent... A, by the way, this is, the author of this is Pastor... Um, what the heck is his name? I can never remember. Poor guy. Samuel Duth. D-E-U-T-H. He has a pretty major ministry in a, of his own. Um, anyways, so... After Jesus was crucified and resurrected three days later, he spent a few final moments with the disciples downloading the critical directions for the mission of the church. As you can imagine, those last conversations with Jesus would have been crucial to understanding what was next for his followers and ultimately for all of us as his church. Before he ascended into heaven, he gave his disciples and all of us after them what we call the Great Commission. Jesus laid out the mission and sent them off to accomplish it. Let's read what Jesus has to say. Right, Matthew 28. Okay, everyone should know this. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Go. That means apostle sent out. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and, I, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Surely, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. First of all, um, that says a lot, okay? Is this, is this just for the apostles? Is this just for, I mean, his audience that he was speaking to? A lot of folks will say that. Oh, yeah, it was for them to go out and spread the gospel. It's for everyone, right? It's for all believers. Uh, and, by the way, I will always, I will, I am always with you, even though I'm going to heaven right now, I will be with you when you do this, Holy Spirit. All we, even to the very end of the age. That means the last day of this age. Therefore, any theory about end times that says the Holy Spirit is going somewhere, or you're going to heaven and watching bad stuff on the bad people on the earth, is false. He will never leave this world. The Holy Spirit is here till the very end, last day of the age, when Jesus returns to take ownership of what we are supposed to be stewarding and increasing the kingdom of God. Okay, Jesus was commissioning them to go and spread the message of God's love, proclaiming that the grace of Jesus provides forgiveness for our sins and brings us close to God again. Now that his disciples had experienced the grace of God, they were instructed to go out and share the good news with the entire world. It's true that not all will, this is critical, okay? It's true that not all will welcome the message or be interested in it. Some may even be persecuted for sharing it. Amen? But when you receive forgiveness and grace, it's crazy to keep it to yourself. That's the millennial message I have. It's crazy for you not to do it. Especially if you have these connections and um, networking, especially the world the way it is, interconnected as it as it never has been in a, never. I mean, it wasn't even a, 20 years ago, it wasn't nearly as connected. Forget 2,000 years ago. This would be a dream come true for the, the apostles to be, um, have access to the internet. Oh my gosh. Imagine if the whole world had an outbreak of a disease that was killing everyone, but you had discovered the antidote that totally cured you. Would you keep it to yourself? Or would you share the answer. I think we would all try to tell everyone we could and distribute it to as many as possible. That's that's um, that's the line that um, 
Kirk Cameron uses a lot. If you had the if you had the cure for cancer, um, would you not tell everyone? We have the cure for death and sin. Uh, in reality, this is what happens because of sin. All the hum- all humanity has a deadly, deadly disease. I think we often forget that the eternity for someone who doesn't believe in Jesus is hell. Skipping on. Jesus has commissioned us with this beautiful message of reconciliation. There is no greater message. There's nothing better that you can be doing with your time. Nothing. There's like we said last week, are you building the kingdom of God or the kingdom of man? Or who are you serving? Which kingdom are you serving? Politics? Hum- human government? The United States? Or your country? Patriotism? Is that really what we're called to do? No, it's not. So how do we share our faith? Okay, millennials or whoever is having a trouble with this. What does it mean and how can we do it in a way that is effective? It's important to know that while it is our job to share our faith with people, we cannot force anyone to accept Jesus. Everyone must make that choice on their own. Well, right. But they have to know it, that the option is there, right? And know the truth. There's false gospels out there. There's false Jesuses out there, right? The biggest one is Islam. And say what you will about other, you know, Christian denominations or whatever. You know, Islam actually teaches a different Jesus and a different gospel. They teach different things about him. So they don't feel compelled to want to know about him because they think they already do. They are taught a good deal about Jesus in, you know, the Quran. Which, of course, is non- it's nonsense. It's not true. It's not what happened. It's not what he's like. It's not testimony of him. It's another one. Some of you didn't exist. So it's important to, even if, you know, someone shuts you down, oh yeah, the Muslims will say a lot, and I hope you um, feel compelled to witness two Muslims, by the way. Um, They will say a lot of times, oh, I love Jesus. They'll say that kind of, again, they are trained from the time they are children in their Sunday schools, okay, in their madrasas, religion school, as they call it, um, from very the earliest ages, answers to you, to Christians who try to convert them, they already have an answer a lot of the time. They're, they have pre-canned responses. And a lot of um, today, a big one is, we love Jesus. I love Jesus. Well, that's a lot of Christians will be disarmed by that. Oh man, really? Wait, I never knew that. I thought you got you know hated Jesus. They'll never say Jesus loves me because they don't have that connection. They don't have that revelation. They've been kept in the dark by Satan on that. Even if we're talking about the same Jesus, which we're not, but even if we were, they don't they don't realize that Jesus loves them. And is watching them, okay, and wants to save them. All that stuff. That Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. Though who they call Allah is actually Jesus Christ. So, um, yeah, we got to, don't back down just because you hear stuff like that. Um, All right, sharing your faith is often called evangelism. But what does that mean and how should we go about it? In Mark 5, Jesus has just healed and forgiven a man. The man who wants to come with Jesus, but Jesus gives him another instruction that I think the best description of what it means to share your faith is. He says, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has have had mercy on you. Sharing your faith is simply telling the story how Jesus has changed your life and helping to introduce someone to Jesus. Now, I don't, I don't uh, entirely agree with that. Th- that's not the whole of it. There's instances and times and entire folks have dedicated their lives to... Um, Evangelism can take that form, and a lot of it, a lot of times, it does. Say, this is what Jesus did for me. This is my testimony. No doubt, no doubt, that's very helpful. But it doesn't have to be that way. They don't have. They don't care what Jesus did or didn't do for you. Sometimes they just want the truth. You know, I mean, it's, again, some people reach through the heart, some people through the mind. Some people have to have a broken. Um, their, their, their 
construct uh, in their mind, broken. Stronghold. About what they believe. They have to get it broken down with an axe. Sometimes with uh, a, you know, a chisel, you chip away here and there. Sometimes you need a sledgehammer. You need to shatter the whole idea of it, a paradigm uh, change. Okay? And again, this you have to depend on the Holy Spirit for this. He'll tell you when to do this or to do that. All right. Almost done. Um, living your faith. The best way to sh- start sharing your faith is to live your faith. Your life won't be perfect, but live your life filled with the love of God in such a way that it is attractive to people and makes them wonder what you have. Well, that's true. We should, they should notice something different about us. Again, like the scriptural precedent, the, um, the way they wouldn't stop talking about the Lord, the way they wouldn't stop when they told to go away. They wouldn't. Stop preaching the name here, they were told by the government, basically, right? The Sanhedrin. Don't, you are not allowed to preach the name of Yeshua here in this city, in Jerusalem, or in the temple. They did it anyway. Well, leading to someone to Jesus, start by loving them. Well, I mean, that sounds kind of wishy-washy, but that goes without saying. If, uh, you know, if you don't, if your heart is not right, you're not going to make a disciple. Um, the Bible says Jesus came to earth as a response to his love for us, not out of obligation. Right, Jesus didn't have to do this. God didn't have to do any of this. He could have flooded the world, killed everyone, and that would be that. Start over. In fact, he right, he had that thought, didn't he? Uh, when we are sharing our faith with someone, let it be out of care, compassion, and love for him or her. This is not a religious formality or a chance to impress people with your spirituality. That's, that's a good point. Um, you don't want to, you know, impress anybody with anything because we have nothing to offer God. Even as a saved person, he's coming through you, right? You're see- they're seeing him through you. You're sitting down so he can come out. Okay, um, that's be- that's sharing your faith. And he has steps in here about if you are first running into someone who has no idea, um, here's some easy ways to approach it. Just the gospel. What's the gospel? Don't be intimidated by this. I think I did a show a while back that says um, sharing the gospel in five minutes or less, something like that. Two minutes or less, maybe. Because it's really, that's it. That's all it takes. Um, You know, just establish a couple things. God created you. He's your father, and he loves you. God created you and loves you. Fact. Now that right there, God is real, okay? And then not only that, but he made you personally, and then he loves you because you're a child of his. That's number one. A lot of folks don't even know that, especially in the West, in America. They're all, you know, atheists or whatever, or they don't believe. Even if there is a God, you know, it's not personal. And then we were separated from him by sin. Sin separated us from God. Yes, that means things are wrong and right and God is a judge. Yes, he is. Our sin needs to be paid for because he's fair. He said, These are the, this is the deal, and we did the opposite, so there has to be justice. It needs to be paid for. Someone's got to pay the penalty. Well, Jesus did that. Because he wants a relationship. He wants to have a family. He doesn't want to kill anyone or send anyone to hell. He wants you to live forever. And he wants you to be in fellowship with him. Be holy like he is. And that's only possible through the blood of the Lamb. And then so, at that point, you know, like, hey, uh, so this is Jesus. This is the deal. This is what God did. Um, He loves you. He created you. He wants you to live with him uh, and have your sin paid for and washed away. And you do that by repenting on the cross of Jesus and following him. And hopefully at that point... They do, and there we go. Now, it's not over, okay, after evangelism, and that's what it is, millennials, right? You just heard it. Um, 
that's it. And then if those who decide to follow now are one of you, now you can disciple them. Disciple the this discipleship process is a real to me. I mean, in my experience, in my walk of life, in in the places that I go and folks that I see, um, we in real you know we're on the ground and online. Discipleship is a huge problem. It's uh, the the lack of discipleship is a huge problem. No one, not no one, but very few are doing it. If you ask. I don't know, maybe I'm totally wrong about this, but if you ask your average Christian, who are you discipling right now? And they'll probably look at you like, what? Huh? What do you mean? <sighs> no matter what your level of faith or experience, you know, if, you're, if you believe for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, or one year, or a month, you should at least be thinking about who you're discipling. And, by the way, being disciple, okay? This is when you sit under authority in the local church or in an online church. Um, This is godly. It doesn't mean somebody's ruling over you or anything like that. It just means you are accepting teaching and instruction in discipleship, in the following of the Lord. Not following of anybody, any man or anything like that on the earth. You're following the Holy Spirit who's guiding you to Jesus. How do, what does he want you to do? How do he want you to act? How does he want you to conduct yourself? Well, part of that, we know. Go make disciples. Go make them. Not not an option. Um, Not just for a certain select group, and not just for 2,000 years ago. Paul did pretty good as, you know, for what he had, because the Lord was with him. And look what happened. And so, by the way, it's come full circle now. Whereas the lands of Christianity, right, where this whole thing began, where all the evangelism happened, where did it, where did it happen? What we know today is Israel, Syria, Turkey, Iraq, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. That was Christian land, okay? That was Christianity. That was not anything but Christians, basically, okay? There, yes, some Jews, obviously, but the Christianity there, it took, that was Christian land. I mean, those were the Christian countries. Imagine that. But now that's all flipped around in its head, and the Christians are almost gone from the places where we were originally sent. So it didn't get better, okay? Um, But this is where we're being driven back, and I think this is why Wings of the Eagle as a ministry has focused, zoomed in on, connect the church, because we're all one church. Um minister and save Israel. They're the center of the story. And then preach to Muslims. Evangelize to Muslims, because most Muslims regard, you know, I don't know what you've heard or what you believe, um, but most Muslims have never heard the gospel. They've never been evangelized by a millennial or anyone else. Especially, you know, and there's, people are have assumptions about who's a Muslim in their town, and pretty much they're in your town. Um, You may have a mosque in your town. I encourage you on a Friday today, after this show, go to your local mosque and pray. See who the Lord will send to you, if anyone. Just come equipped with maybe something to hand out, a tract, um, or whatever. Or just pray for those inside, because guess what? Regardless of how nice or good... Those folks are, they're on the wrong team. You know, it, it, Jesus didn't say, well, John fourteen six, but unless, if, right? Anyway, let's, that's all. I just want to impress that upon you. Most Muslims, especially if they're immigrants, and that is some of it, but not in my town. Most of them are homegrown, okay? In other words, they're Americans, and they were probably Christians in the past, but somebody convinced them to convert to Islam. Um, So we have to reverse that. But especially immigrants from other countries who come from Muslim countries, who come from Syria or, you know, somewhere in Africa and so forth, they've likely never heard the gospel preached in their life. They were born and raised in mosques. That's what they know. That's what they believe. And in their, again, this is a satanic overlay on that system, is that 
you're born into it. You, you are told, you're, it's a lie, of course, but you are told if you're born into a family of Muslims, you're automatically one. doesn't matter what you think. You are one. And that's why they get this whole honor killing and, and um, extreme persecution from your family is usually the worst kind when you become a Christian from a Muslim um, family. It's because they, they take it personal. Like you're betraying them. Like, what do you mean? You're not one of us anymore. You're not part of the family anymore. And again, that can happen with different uh, religions. I get it. The Jews act the same way. Some Christian families would would react that way too. Um, Hopefully not, because we know there's a spiritual element here. But um, anyway, so that's part of the that's part of the deal, and that's why they have to be um, witnessed to. Okay, and so, right, discipling. That's where we're back to that. Uh, Liz says, that, oh, who are the older Christians discipling? I feel I need to put that to my local church. Yes! <laughs> yes! Exactly. Who are you discipling? Where are they? You know, it doesn't have to be a whole laundry list. It could, one person, one at a time, I figure. That's probably good. Um, but you're investing in them, you know? You're investing in their eternal life you're sowing holy spirit into your you're bringing out their gifts you're you're bringing them closer to god and they're going to be eternally grateful that's a literal eternally grateful um and then that's going to give them the confidence to disciple someone else it should be a constant thing again it's just so missing in our experience and i'm not sure um where that happened where where that went wrong um but it's just not really around again it could be me i just could be my personal experience and 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 walk and where i'm where i'm at but it's never come to me like hey who are you who are you discipling nowadays you know maybe it's automatic now in the position that god has me in or like you're you're impacting folks you have no clue that you've ever even met and they're, you know, saying, hey, this was really impactful when you were here. I just heard that today, this morning or last night from a sister. And, you know, I know we're Facebook friends or whatever, but she rarely comments on anything or, you know, we're not, we're not intertwined in any way, I don't think. And then, you know, she makes a comment like, oh, yeah, I saw you at some, you know, at some conference like a couple of years ago and it was really impacted me. I'm like, What? <sighs> And um, anyway, that's 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 God. That's that's all it is. That's the Holy Spirit. Um, way way more than we deserve, all the time. Okay. Uh, any questions, comments, or concerns? I've I've pretty much gone to the end of this subject. Let's see here. Uh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth's doing good. She's got a lot of comments here today. Uh, the book you mentioned looks great. Yeah. It's, here again, it's called Following Jesus. Real simple, okay? Uh, Samuel Duth, D-E-U-T-H, is the author. He, again, he has a church and ministry. He's got a couple of books out there. But this one is just so to the point. And share with your kids. I mean, that's what I try to do is, uh, like bedtime, um, instead of just, you know, straight Bible, sometimes you can say, hey, this is what we, this is the church. Here, this is the prayer and worship, the Bible, baptism, Holy Spirit, the church, sharing your faith, that's what's in here. All right. Um, Elizabeth says, books looks great. Um, winning winning God's way. Uh, nine words to win. Why wham? Yeah, that's uh, youth with a mission and all that. Yeah, yeah. That's good stuff. The Eastern religions have crept into West, Western society. Yes. George Harrison from the Beatles was the first celebrity I knew that was into Hare Krishna. Yeah, true, true. I mean, these they're everywhere, and a lot of stuff, okay? In my generation, the, the Generation X, um, there was... Christianity was not cool. It just wasn't. I mean, you went... Some kids went to church with their families, and that was it. Um, or if you went and did the church thing on the weekends, you were weird. You weren't normal. You were weird. Um, you know, we did... You know, the kids, they don't know what to believe. We get our info from movies and from 
um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, Ouija board. You know, like things like that. This is bad. <laughs> this is not cool. Um, so yeah, my generation definitely is uh, guilty. Yeah, so that's basically it. Who who are you discipling? Who um, who's discipling you? It's a never-ending process. I figure. I figure the only one off the hook really are, are Peter and the boys, as far as being discipled, because the master actually discipled them personally. Um, but other than that, I figure it's continual till you're dead, right? Unt- until you go be with the Lord personally yourself. Um, you should always be, you know, being discipled. And I'm, I'm, um, I am proud, if that's the right word, um, to be under, you know, a lead pastor, Randy Scott, who is, uh, has a wealth of experience and wisdom. And even if, again, he is from a very different (laughs) place okay he was not born into a you know some kind of pastor family and he went to he went to college bible college right away and and he went to ywam you know it's like the the i guess what we call the normal path he was not that um so i really relate to that even though i'm much more of a you know try to my family try to keep me in that world and um but it was never um, officially, you know, it was never a structured thing. It was like, oh, we'll go here and anyway, that's awesome. So I I feel very blessed to to be uh being disciple. He might not even realize that that's what's, that's what's happening, and maybe it needs to be more vocalized. Um, but so just find the hello to everyone who's who just joined recently. By the way, welcome. Um. I would definitely say, and women with women and men with men. I think that's right. I don't, I don't probably, you know, again, if you're teacher and student situation, like I've, I'm in the Sunday school or whatever, um, you can't avoid that. Or if you're a pastor, obviously, you know, women are going to come to you and, and for this and that. But um, I think the as far as discipling goes, I think women should stay and men should stay because that's, I think it's right. I don't. I don't think it's scriptural to do it the other way. Could be wrong about that. I don't know. Um, but definitely, it's all the relational, like the issues that men have, are very easy to share with another man versus a woman, where it would never come up. Right, most likely, and then all kind of weird stuff can happen in there anyway. We don't want that. We don't want to have any kind of risk of anything. The flesh is very, very deceitful. The heart is deceitful above all things. And um, we don't want to even have that occasion, the near occasion of sin. That's the old Catholic way to say it from my childhood. Avoid the near occasion of sin. Don't even put yourself in the room that it might happen, temptation. Okay? So I do think uh, women, again, for example, who are you discipling? What young woman? Young, young in the faith. They could even be you know, older than you. Or the same age, but if they're new to, to Jesus, new to Christianity, then they'd be younger than you in spirit. Um, and who are you being discipled under? Same thing. All right, so let, I don't know, let's just all think and pray and mull that over and meditate on it, um, really get some, uh, get some answers from the Lord, and that we would obey, by the way, his answer. <laughs> that was a big thing this morning. Um, you know, prayer is... I read a quote from another um, prayer devotional. Uh, prayer is not your list of requests to God. Uh, prayer is you obeying what he tells you. Right, you're not ordering him to do something. You're getting orders. That's what it is. You're getting orders. So, best to probably do it. All right, friends. Uh, I guess we'll take a quick break and be right back. This is Wings of the Eagle Radio. Uh, I'm Christopher Banti, your host as always, and we'll be right back. Wings of the Eagle brings the truth of Jesus Christ and Bible prophecy to the world by facilitating a free global communications network for the saints and publishing teaching that will educate and exhort believers and witness to non-believers. 
we will never be afraid or a respecter of persons. If you believe in this mission, partner with us by donating financially now. Your donations are vital to pay for Wings of the Eagle platforms and infrastructure which we need to operate. Please donate today and help keep us on the forefront of the battle until he returns. Both one-time and monthly gifts are greatly appreciated and necessary. God bless you. All around the world. We're available at the App Store and on Google Play. Download now for free. Anywhere, anytime. It's that easy. Thanks for listening. And now, Wings of the Eagle Radio. Yeah, Wings of the Eagle Radio, back for the last part here, last segment. I never realized how long these things go. We're only 45 minutes in. I thought it was like 20 minutes. Oh, well. That's the curse of the pastor, I guess. Uh, Olivia. Hey, Olivia. Been a long time. Jesus told us to share the gospel to the ends of the earth. To disciple is to further strengthen a person's foundation in the Lord. Yep. You know, in the truest sense, you really have to, to understand the... Um, Hebraic, okay, the the Jewishness of that term. Um, it's to study a student, disciple, as you're disciplining yourself under the instruction of another. So basically, it means student, and rabbi would be teacher, right? So you're studying under a rabbi. That means you're disciple. You're a disciple of him, and it didn't have to be. Um, a Messiah, okay, it was just something you did. If you wanted to learn the Word of God, you discipled yourself under someone who, who already knew it. That's the way the Jews did it, and that's the way we're to do it. I don't mean become a Jewish person. I'm saying this in the Christian paradigm, okay, this is the same thing. You're a student, you're learning, you're being disciplined in the faith, in the Word of God, in the Spirit of God, that's the Christianity uh, has that Judaism denies and doesn't, but the Holy Spirit is here and active and speaking to us and within us and between us and between the discipled and the discipler, whatever. First Timothy 5, 2 Timothy 5.2 Treat older women as you would treat your mother, younger women with all purity as your own sisters. Right. And I mean, that, that's, I think you're following up on the whole, you know, men and women not being weird. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Got to do that. <clears throat> All right, praise God. So, um, what did I, I said? I would uh, get back to some other question in the beginning. Was that Alex? Uh, oh, so before I forget, just to close out on this. So, millennials, half of millennials, basically saying it's wrong to want to convert someone. That's what they're really saying. To, to share your faith with the intention that they would stop believing what they do and start believing what you do. Well, my gosh. If, if, you don't, if you don't understand that, you don't understand what you believe at all. You don't understand what Jesus told you to do. The Spirit is not clear in your life, <laughs> if you think that. If you think that it's wrong to want to have someone change their belief. Well, you're supposed to. We're all supposed to. Anyway. All right, so that's it. So go to your millennial, okay, that you know, and um, make sure we instill in them that evangelism is not wrong. Not only is it not wrong, it's required. It's beyond good. It's a mission of all believers. Okay. And it doesn't say we're all succeeding. I'm not succeeding the way I want to be. Again, it's sometimes you just have... It's better to have one, I think, than, than ten who you check in on once a month. You know what I mean? No, I'm not off the radio yet. You can't call me. Oh, oh man. Anyway, oh, okay, so what's this question from Alex? Um, think the Red Horseman is on the way. Well, he's definitely on the way. Yeah. Uh, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Uh, the Red Horse being Iran. Um, he's definitely getting cranked up here. Now, I, I never know. I don't know. I don't have information, and the Bible doesn't give us information, I don't think, about what makes him come out, what makes the red horseman ride, what makes the, the, the bear chew down on the, the meat around him and the other nations around him, what makes the ram 
charge out to the north, west, and south. We're not told, I don't believe, unless we're missing something, we're not told what the reason is. So we're left to speculate. And I don't really like doing that because it doesn't really do any good <laughs> until we know. So, um, yeah, it could be. A, you, you can make educated guesses. There's something to do with it, you know, fighting ISIS or, or the Kurdish question with the Kurds since they are in the very lands that are described. Um, maybe it's Syria saving Bashar al-Assad from being deposed. Um, something in Lebanon or... Or Saudi Arabia, they're enemies of Saudi Arabia. They could decide we're going to go invade them now. Like it could be any of that stuff. Um, although they have, you know, I must say, uh, Iran has succeeded, at least to this point, of keeping Assad in power. Russia was helping, but um, the West has totally abandoned the Western nations, the EU, you know, Europe and America. As we've completely abandoned the talk of Assad leaving power. I have not heard that in two years. Well, a year. Trump doesn't say it anymore. Did he ever say it? I'm not sure he did. Um, you know, he wants to for us, our troops to leave and just be done with it. But up till, up till then, it was all Assad must go, Assad must go, Assad must go. Now all of a sudden it's not. So you got to give Iran the credit for that. Uh, they they stuck it out. They gave him tons of money, weapons, uh, what he needed to stay in power. And he's not in control of the country. He's just about a third of it. Um, and we're going to see here because now ISIS is really feeling the pressure. They're getting some really bad publicity. Um, the caliphate is not dead. It's still alive. It's smaller, but it's there. And so we'll see. We'll see. I right, just stay in prayer and be watchful, obviously, and be ready to respond. Be ready to respond. Be ready to respond. Um, and again, we um, just before I go, I want to mention you that we are working. I am working on a book uh, that I, people have been telling me to write books forever. I just say no, thanks. It's not my thing. I don't have the discipline for that. But then the Lord says, you know, you got to write this one. Okay, you you just. You have to, because no one else is going to do it. And it's called Fleet of the Mountains. Uh, Fleet of the Mountains is about the church's role in the Great Tribulation. Uh, we all, you know, can see, check off the items on the list. Oh, the beast, the Antichrist, the the mark, the whatever, the 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 nations raging, the UN, whatever you think um, is coming X, Y, and Z. But we're not. Really, okay, what am I going to do when that happens? What am I going to do? Am I being proactive? Am I being strategic? End Time Church was founded by Jake McCandless and I because of that reason, to be strategic, to be forward-thinking, because we, we, stuff's going to happen when it's going to happen. Okay, We don't control that, but when it does, and if we think it's close, then it's our responsibility to be ready. To be prepared to face it, how are we going to respond? And some things never change. So witnessing the gospel, you're, you know, you're providing your testimony, being a disciple, making disciples, those things will never, ever, ever change no matter where we are in history, whether we're just coasting along here in the uh, you know, 2019 or if we're at the end of the age and Jesus is coming tomorrow, we, which he's not, um, we still have to... Uh, be disciples, make disciples, spread the gospel, give a true and faithful witness, okay? Those things are never different. But during Jacob's trouble, during the Great Tribulation, the whole last 70 weeks of Daniel, seven years, 70th week of Daniel, and especially the last half of it, which is the the most pressure that's ever been, Jesus says, um, during that time, we are going to have a job, the church. And so the book is going to detail why that is, the scriptural case for it, um, what the details are going to be, some of them, where to go, what to do, that's going to be in there. So pray that uh, I would have the right words and the discipline, most of all, talking about discipling, the discipline to finish on time. We put a self-imposed kind of deadline as March 1st for um, first three chapters so we can get it out to publishers and um, we'll see what happens after that. And the whole thing, I'm aiming to be finished by August um, for printing. All right, so 
keep that please i need it constantly um help in that support prayer support and um other support <laughs> all right that's it um all right well we got one more comment elizabeth is on fire uh she says i looked up one of the articles with that name at the end of it says something really interesting i think she's talking about the the barna um survey it says younger folks are tempted to believe instead if we just live good enough lives we can forego the conversation entirely and people around us will almost magically come to know jesus through our good actions and selfless character <laughs> wrong right? as elizabeth says wrong that's right. That's right. It will not happen that way. It just doesn't. I mean, this is kind of like that old, really, really bad um, quote that's attributed to uh, Augustine or Thomas Aquinas or one of the really old guys um, attributed to him that says, share the gospel with everyone you meet. If necessary, use words. <laughs> like, what? Wait a minute. Wait a second here. Uh, that's not what Jesus said at all. At all. It doesn't mean we're not an example. It doesn't mean we're not to live godly lives. It's not to mean that they can't see our behavior and this love that's within us and all that and see something different and want to know. Right? That thing, that stuff happens, and it can and it will, but that's not, that's like a byproduct of just being a believer. That's not doing anything intentional. That's not spreading the gospel. It has to be with the mouth. By the confession of your lips, Jesus is Lord. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Then you will be saved. That's it. You have to say it. And then how else are you going to, how are they going to know without a preacher? What does that mean? They have to be told with words. <laughs> okay? We can, there are a lot of quote unquote good behaved people out there okay nice people a lot of nice people in the world who believe all kinds of bad stuff who are going to hell nice people will go to hell along with the mean people it doesn't if you're forgiven all that's gone right we understand that you can be a mean christian hopefully you're not but you can be so don't base your niceness or not on uh somehow being close to god it's not that's all flesh okay um, I love you. I'm done for the day. It's already 12 noon, so get out there. Uh, be productive for God. And, uh, and the Holy Spirit guide you. Indeed, go to the mosque today. Pray. Uh, or go with a group. Go with, that's what I would suggest. Go with someone, at least one other, at least. Um, don't make it a mob or anything like that. Um, just go for prayer. And if God sends you someone awesome, just... Uh, you know, see what's going on. Uh, witness as led. And uh, just don't be afraid. That's all. All right. Love you guys. This is Wings of the Eagle Radio brought to you by your support, your tithes and offerings at End Time Church. If you were to participate with us, I highly encourage you, if you're looking for a church uh, or any kind of congregation to get it right and be on mission, that's us. End Time Church, Monday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern. We get together. Uh, you can see it later. If you're not, just get the app. Go to End Time Church app on uh, Apple App Store or the Google Play a store for Android. Hook up with us, and um, we'll, we will give, and we have, and we continue, we'll continue to give everything that comes in, every dollar, at least 25% of it, to missions in the Middle East. That's unprecedented, period. No church does that. None. Zero. 1% of the world's mission money is sent to the Middle East. 1%. All churches, 1%. And only 5% go to any mission. 5%. Churches only send 5% out the door to missions. 5 We do 25 And it's strategically, directly to them. It doesn't mean anything other than God has directed us to do that, and it's because where everything is focusing on and where the storm is coming. So the gospel's got to be there, in the middle of the storm. He will calm the storm, amen? All right, folks, love y'all. This has been Wings of the Eagle Radio, Christopher Manti. Uh, hook up with us on Facebook if you haven't already. Sign up for our uh, mailing list. And text, get text, by the way. If you text the word 
prepare, and we're going to roll even more of these uh, out soon. But if you uh, text the word prepare, I'm trying to get the right number, to the number 31996, 31996, text the word prepare to 31996, you will be alerted every time we have a church service, every time there's a Bible study, or anything like that, any type of major announcement, or God forbid some emergency, we'll use, get it right to your text, to your phone. All right, again, text prepare to 31996. Very good. All right, guys. See you next time. I love you. Oh, Ray Comfort. Yes, yes, he is awesome. If you want to evangelize in public, on the street, definitely. Ray is the man to emulate, I think. I figure, well, of course, Jesus. All right, that's it. Goodbye. I love you all. Until next time, this is Wings of the Eagle Radio. Until next time, pray always. Meet with others who know what's coming. Join the free network at wingsoftheeagle.com and spread the word. The destiny of the final generation of the saints of God draws near. 